All right, so these are our slides for the West Africa in medieval times notes. Please make sure that you do type in everything that is underlined on my notes. Um, I'm not going to go particularly fast or particularly slow because you do have control over the video. You're able to pause it at any point, so feel free to do that. And um, please know I will not be posting my slides themselves. This is the only post related to your notes um, because you need to be listening to this lecture and following along rather than just copying and pasting whatever I put up. So we'll start. Um, our essential question for this set of notes is how did Africa become the focus of world powers uh, during medieval times? And so really what we're looking at is what was medieval Africa like? And why were powers like Europe or Asia, why are they interested in what Africa is doing? What is so unique about that area? What makes Africa special, etc. So looking at the basic geography of Africa, um, we have already discussed this at the beginning of the year, but it is the world's second largest continent. Um, if you want to try to remember what the first largest continent is, you should let me know, um, either in a comment or a quick text. Um, Africa can be divided into basically five geographical zones. You have the rainforests, which make up about 10% of the overall area. So remember, rainforests are particularly dense areas, really wet, um, pretty good for agriculture, but definitely specific agriculture because not all plants like it with that humidity. Um, you have the grasslands. So this is, you know, the area where it's, you know, the open, open um, Sahara type thing. Um, the savanna, which is the tropical grassland, um, dotted with small trees and shrubs. So this is what we think of when we look at the Lion King, right? We have that grassland, but there's a little bit of that tropical sense. There's um, uh, plenty of plant life for animals to either hide or use as food. That makes up about 40% of Africa's area. Uh, so you have rainforests as 10%, small portion, but definitely um, an area you want to be near if you're trying to survive. The grasslands, um, the savanna itself is 40% of Africa's area. And then we get to the deserts. You guys, deserts are 40% of Africa's area as well. Now, if you think about it, that means 80% of Africa is basically tropical grassland or desert. That doesn't really leave a lot of area left over. Um, but the deserts are 40% of Africa, and the world's largest desert, the Sahara, is located in Africa, right? And you looked at that on your map activity where we have the camels um, and the trade routes going through the Sahara Desert. It's incredibly difficult to go across, even today, um, with modern technology. It just really isn't safe um, because it is incredibly uh, deadly. And then we, the last little uh, area where we would say is a geographic zone would be kind of in the Mediterranean area up here where it's a mild climate. It's not particularly dry. It's not particularly hot. It's kind of like what we would probably think of um, here in California. Trade in Africa. So the Sahara is going to prevent trading, right? It's really hard to cross the Sahara if you don't have a way to get across safely where you can carry um, things like water and food. Um, if you get lost, it's just impossible to survive. And so basically Northern Africa and Western Africa for thousands of years could not communicate to each other because the Sahara Desert was placed right between them. However, in about 200 CE, uh, the Romans actually bring the uh, Central Asian camel to Africa. So remember the Roman Empire kind of spread down across where Egypt is, right? They took over Egypt at some point. And so when the Romans are in northern Africa, they actually bring in the camel and it changes the face of trade in Africa. Because of the camel, they are actually able to create caravans where they can cross the Sahara pretty safely. Camels don't need a lot of water, they can store water, um, and their uh, feet are designed much better for walking through sand, whereas horses really, uh, they're not, their hooves are not particularly good for crossing sand. Um, and so the Berber traders actually create caravans or those groups of people or merchants traveling together to cross the Sahara based on the introduction of the camel. They're gonna trade things like gold, ivory, spices, Leather even, um, ostrich feathers will also be traded between the northern area of Africa and the western area of Africa. Um, more importantly, you guys, enslaved people are actually going to be traded between the two areas as well. And so um, it's important to remember, we'll talk about slavery more towards the end of this, but it's important to remember that slavery is not necessarily a new thing. Um, it's not something that originated in Africa or anything like that. Um, 
most of the time when you lost a war, you were a slave, right? That's just how it worked. And so when people lost wars, they were um, made into slaves for that civilization. And then with the introduction of um, trade between Western and Northern Africa, they're able to actually start trading people across um, that area. And so you have kind of the introduction of the, um, the African slave trade. We need to talk about the West African kingdoms. Um, the first one we're going to focus on is Ghana. So as you know from your map, Ghana is the first uh, empire within Western Africa. And so you can see here on the map, it wasn't necessarily that large, um, but it is the first empire that we at least have record of. Uh, it was really important in regards to trade because of its location. So it was kind of an area of the crossroads where trade had to go through Ghana no matter where you were going. Um, it was located between the Sahara salt mines and the gold mines because those are the two most valuable resources uh, Africa has. Ghana was perfectly situated. They can make a lot of money off of that. Uh, the empire actually relied on its military power, uh, not necessarily to control its people, but to control the trade of gold and salt. So you really couldn't get gold or salt from Africa without going through Ghana because their military is focused on protecting those resources from other people using it and um, making money off of it. They could afford to actually give all soldiers iron weapons. So this, especially for the time, I mean, you walk in, their military power is not only wealthy because of the money that they're collecting, but they're wealthy because they actually have weapons for every single soldier that are pretty good quality. They made a lot of money off of the merchants who are traveling back and forth. Um, don't forget that as a merchant, if I'm going through an area, so if I'm going through Ghana, I'm going to have to pay taxes, right? I'm going to have to pay a fee to say, hey, I'm here to enter your empire and I'm here to trade things. So here is your part of the tax. And so when the empire is able to collect those taxes, they're able to make sure that their people and their soldiers have a lot of money. We then get to Mali. So Mali is... Um, as you saw on your map, it's a little bit below Ghana, but it's still a similar area. They basically conquered what is the remains of the Ghana Empire in the 1200s. So um, again, history is a bunch of empires layered on top of each other, right? So, you know, the Roman Empire took over parts of Alexander the Great's empire. Um, the uh, Ottoman Empire took over areas that were already, you know, settled down and civilized. And so what happens is Ghana is falling apart. Every empire has its rise and fall. And then Mali comes in and they're going to conquer the remains of that and then build their empire on top of it. Like Ghana, they're going to build its power um, based on that trade of salt and gold. I cannot emphasize enough how important gold and salt is to especially medieval Africa. Um, these two items are incredibly valuable. Most people in Mali were farmers. Uh, so that means that Mali, even though if you look at it, it's a little bit more spread out than Ghana was. You have farmers living in small villages. Um, further and further away from where you would have like the center of power with the king or the emperor. So what happens is they develop a system where local rulers are going to collect the taxes and then they're going to send those taxes to the king of Mali. Um, so it's similar to what Europe has going on, right? So, you know, England, for example, had a king. There are little villages everywhere. Those villagers pay their local lord um, money, and then the lord then sends the money on to the king. Same thing here, right? In Mali, we have one king of the Mali um, empire, and the local rulers are going to be the ones collecting the fees from the farmers. They were heavily influenced by Islam at this point. So Ghana um, has some Islamic influence, but really not that much, just based on its time period. Um, Mali, on the other hand, can be heavily influenced by Islam. So uh, when Mansa Musa uh, takes control of the Mali Empire, he almost doubles the size, um, basically because they're all united, right? We're not only united by language and our way of life, we're, we're united by our religion. And so when everybody is that, you know, that, that united under one single um, idea or ideology, uh, it's pretty easy to, to control them and then to kind of expand under there. So Mansa Musa, um, if you've watched the Ed Buzzle video, you already know a bit about him. He was possibly the most wealthy human in written history that we have record of. Um, he actually devalues gold on one of his trips because he has so much of it. Uh, and it beca it's because he's the emperor of uh, Mali where they are producing gold and salt. The final West African kingdom that we tend to focus on in world history is the Songhai Empire. Um, in around 1464, uh, Songhai is going to become its own empire. It originally is an area 
of Mali, but Sunny Ali is going to become the ruler of Songhai in 1464. You'll notice that it's kind of south of the Mali Empire, but it still has bits of it. So like Mali would be about here, Ghana would be about here, and then the Songhai Empire is just replacing both of those, right? Um, the ruler it basically extends the territory to include more of the salt mines. Um, you guys, I know salt doesn't really seem that important, especially since you can buy it at like the 99 cent store today, but salt is so valuable at this time. Salt has the ability to preserve our food. So if you're not, you know, if you don't have a refrigerator because it hasn't been invented yet um, and you don't have access to ice, you have to salt your food. So think of it as like jerky. Uh, it helps you to have food year round. It preserves things. It also is required for you to survive, especially in such a hot area. Um, You'll have to talk to your science teacher more, but basically you guys, our bodies require salt to function. And so what happens is if you don't have salt, you get incredibly dehydrated, your body can't um, can't hold water properly, and you die. And so with, with this especially hot area in um, Africa, they need salt to survive. And so it's so valuable that they're able to make a lot of money off of it. Now, by 1492, Songhai is going to become the largest empire in Western Africa. Again, Mali is gone, Ghana is gone, um, but Songhai is going to uh, really be the reigning force in uh, the late 1400s. Uh, by 1600, they're going to fall apart um, when invaders from Northern Africa kind of come in and take over. Now, we're going to go over all three of those empires again, focusing on just government. So the governments in Ghana... Again, we have kings, right? We have the kings who are going to be the last say, but they do have advisors who come from the royal household. And um, Ghana got to the point where they basically decide to divide their empire into districts, kind of like states, right? Um, we're going to divide it into districts where villages belong to a chief's clan, and that chief is going to be in charge of that area. Remember, a clan is like a family that lives together or a group of people that lives together where... Um, it's based on kind of like that loyalty to one another. Now, what's interesting about Africa and especially Ghana is the fact that the kingdom's always inherited by the son of the king's sister. And this is very different from everywhere else in Europe, right? Um, so what you're looking at is uh, basically in Europe, it's, you know, the king has a son, the son inherits, the son has a son, that son inherits. What happens here is if the king dies, the king's sister's son will inherit the throne. So this is a matrilineal inheritance. If you've done your vocabulary, matrilineal meaning going through the mother's bloodline. And that's just because they really valued women in the society. And it's very unique for the time, honestly. Um, especially in Europe where, you know, no one who is female is going to ever inherit anything for quite some time. But uh, Ghana is very ahead of it. And they track their lineage through the mother's bloodline instead of the father's. Mali has a similar government to Ghana, but they were a lot larger. They had a lot more land and a lot more people. So they have a strong central government controlled by the king. Uh, the king controls everything. He's going to have the last say. He has a lot of power. And so what they do is they turn it more into like a military district where generals are in charge of those districts. So remember Ghana up here, they're dividing into districts where the chief's clan is kind of there. So it's that, you know, the family life where you're already there. Uh, you just kind of keep your culture and then somebody above the chief is in charge. Um, but with Mali, they're going to have a strong central government where the king is in control of everything. And then his generals are in charge of the districts instead of having that family, um, the family tie. The structure relies on a very large and capable army, right? If you have generals in charge of districts, you have your army in charge of districts, you have to have a good army that you can trust. You have to have an army that's not going to betray you. You have to have an army that's going to report back to you accurately. And so Mali was much more of a military empire, um, at least in comparison to Ghana. When we get to Songhai, um, again, it divides its area into provinces. It's just smart, you guys. As a king, if I cannot reach every area of my empire in one day, it makes sense that I'm going to divide it into smaller sections where somebody else is in control and then they report back to me. So each province in Songhai, because they are so large, every single province is going to have a governor, a tax collector, a court of judges, and a trade inspector. And so what you're looking at is a much more bureaucratic system, right? Remember bureaucracy, meaning we have a lot of employees in one government. Um, very, very uh, similar here in Songhai to um, 
what we see in Asia where uh, China has their bureaucracy government where there's just a lot of officials in charge of every single thing. And so in Shanghai, the province is going to have that governor, right? The governor is in charge of controlling that specific area. They're hired by the king to do that job. The tax collector is focusing on just the money. Um, the judges are focusing on just the law. And then there's a trade inspector making sure that the income that they're collecting is correct. They end up maintaining their peace with a really strong navy and then the soldiers on horseback, um, similar to what Molly was doing. Now we get to culture and society. You guys, families are the base of society across most of African history. And so the family is the center of life. Um, a lot of times they lived with their extended families, so we're talking aunts, uncles, cousins, second cousins, um, great grandparents, everybody's in the same area because they live with their extended families and they're as, they act as one unit. Um, now extended families might live in the same area, so if my extended family is living near my husband's extended family, and then, um, you know, my cousin's extended family or whatever it is, right, everybody is all grouped together and that's going to create larger groups of people known as lineage groups. Elders in all uh, cultures were respected. They have more power than the young. It's kind of just the tradition of, um, you know, uh, the older people know more, right? That whole thing. So respecting the elders was incredibly important, and then the young are supposed to learn and grow from them. Um, the Bantu immigrants, or sorry, migrants, um, they come to Africa about 3000 BCE, so before the common era, right? Um, they bring pretty similar languages, cultures, technologies with them. Um, you can see here that we're looking at a modern day breakdown of languages. And you guys, the Bantu language is very much alive and well, um, especially in the southern part of Africa. Now the Bantu villages were matrilineal. So that's kind of where they get the idea of, hey, let's go from the mother's uh, genealogy rather than the father's. And so when women married, they joined their husband's family. But remember in Europe, women, when they got married, the woman's father had to give the, the girl a dowry, right? That present of, here, thank you for taking my daughter. Here is a bunch of gold to go with her. Well, in African culture, especially the Bantu culture, which is basically setting up this um, culture that we still see today, they actually say, hey, our women are so valuable that you need to give me a dowry for me to let my daughter join your, your uh, family. So we're talking about not necessarily purchasing wives, but what we're looking at is the husband's family having to come up with a dowry where it's like, thank you for gifting us with this, um, with this woman. Now, education-wise, you guys, um, it's actually really fascinating. There's not necessarily like a, a government system of education, but traditionally children were raised by their mothers until about the age of six. And that's where they're going to learn language and family history and songs. And so it's all about the talking, right? Um, and that's where if you've watched that Ed Puzzle video with John Green, oral history, this is keeping African culture alive. Africa did not write their stuff down, but we know a lot about them because they passed it down through oral history, meaning they're talking about it. And this is exactly where it starts. Mothers are responsible for teaching all of their children the languages they need to speak, the family history of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years of genealogy, songs for their culture, etc. So that oral history is going to keep traditions alive um, and it's going to track that genealogy so you know where you came from. Around the age of six, boys and girls get kind of sent to different places in order to consider, continue their education. And again, we're not talking about like a formal school or a formal area where you have to go and travel. Um, instead, fathers are going to take over the son's education. And we see that boys learn to hunt, fish. They grow plants and crops and fields. They learn to clear the fields for planting purposes. Um, this is a picture of a hunt in Africa, um, I think in the early 1900s. Um, and then women or girls are going to stay with their mothers, right? So boys go to their fathers and then girls stay with their mothers. And what you see here is that the girls are going to learn how to care for their homes. They're going to work in the fields. They're going to be good wives and mothers. And they learn that cultural system. And so the education of everyone within African culture, especially at this time, was the root of the family, right? The mothers are responsible for passing down these oral traditions. The fathers are responsible for passing down, here's how we're gonna provide for our families. And then you can see here that girls are gonna stay with their mothers in order to learn how to set up um, their own family units and to prepare for teaching their own children. Now, looking at specifically African women at this time, um, you guys, women mostly acted as wives and mothers, but there are a lot of records from European explorers 
who kind of went down to Africa at various points in history, and they actually were amazed to learn that women are serving as soldiers and rulers in some areas of Africa. And so I'd like to highlight two um, specific women, and I'm going to apologize in advance because I think I'm going to butcher their names. Um, so Queen um, Dahia al-Kahina, uh, she led an army against Arab invaders in the 600s CE, and so this is a statue of her um, today. And... Um, we see that she is not only a queen of an, a nation, but she's actually leading the army as well. And so it's not just where, in Europe, where if you are a queen and you're in control of the country, cool, but you have to rely on your generals to run your army. Um, in Africa, we actually have a queen who is going to lead her own army, and she is successful. Uh, then we have Queen um, Nzinga, um, who spent 30 years fighting the, against the Portuguese. Um, and she resisted the slave trade. You guys, I know it's kind of weird to think of Portugal as a world power. Portugal is a teeny tiny country off of Spain. Um, today, they're, um, I mean, I'm not going to say that they're not a world power, but they're really not that much of a world power. But Portugal actually is responsible for all the European nations going down to Africa and trying to take their gold and their salt and for starting the slave trade because Portugal is the first to go down to Africa and they're like, hey, look at all this stuff we can get. And so um, when they arrive, they actually see a queen of her nation and here she is here, um, a queen who's gonna spend 30 years of her reign fighting against them and resisting the slave trade coming to Africa. Um, music and dance is the last major category, if I remember correctly, um, that we're going to cover in regards to culture and society. Um, music and dance, you guys, was used to express religious feelings, so to stop the boredom of everyday tasks. So if we're in the fields planting or harvesting crops, we're going to have songs to sing and kind of connect as a community. Um, you can see that there was a group singing, um, pattern with something called a call and repeat. So if, uh... The leader is singing out the song they might you know sing something and then everybody else sings um, the response to whatever it is um, you should definitely look on YouTube for um, these kinds of things because there's some really beautiful examples of call and repeat songs um, you guys these are songs that we actually see in United States history as well because when Africans are brought over here as slaves they bring with them their songs of um, their tradition, and they turn into songs of religious faith and hope. And we call them spirituals in um, U.S. history. And so what happens is, with um, slavery in the United States, um, as well as the fall of slavery, we have those songs turning from spirituals into eventually evolving into things like the blues, ragtime, jazz, rock and roll, rap. Um, all of these musical genres can actually be traced back to that music and dance from African culture way back when. And so you see here on the side, you have um, the picture of today, you know, keeping their traditions alive through dance. Louis Armstrong is quite possibly the most famous um, African-American uh, jazz artist. And you see here early rock and roll um, artist. Uh, again, all of it coming from African music and culture. We're gonna um, talk about slavery in Africa um, pretty briefly, because you're going to cover slavery quite a bit more in eighth grade. But um, this is kind of the root of the transatlantic slave trade, uh, sorry, slave trade, meaning that we are looking at slaves from Africa being brought to other areas. And again, it starts with Portugal. So in 1441, a Portuguese ship comes to Africa, they capture 12 Africans, and they bring them back to Portugal as slaves and as examples of, hey, look at what Africa has to offer, which is a horrible thing to say and to think about, but that's how it was viewed. And so the slave trade has officially begun in 1441 with the Portuguese bringing um, Africans back to Portugal. Now, Africa had slavery within Africa itself, and it was practiced pretty historically throughout the world, right? Rome had slaves. Egypt had slaves. Um, slavery is pretty widespread across almost every single culture in the history of the world. Now, that doesn't make it right in any way, but what it is, is uh, what it does show us is that this is not necessarily something um, that was driven by race at the beginning. It will become a factor of race later in history, but at its origin, it was practiced because, hey, you lost the war, you now belong to me. So again, those defeated enemies are used as slaves. Those defeated enemies are the ones that have lost their war, and now they're going to be serving the people who conquered them. Well, what happens is slave trade in Africa is going to grow as their contract as their contact with the Muslim world is going to increase. 
remember that Islam kind of starts not in Africa, but in the Middle Eastern area and then will spread from there. Um, what this means, you guys, is the Quran, the holy book of Islam, it actually banned the slavery of any Muslims. And so that means that when you are an Arab merchant in the Middle East, uh, the minute that your slaves convert to Islam and become true Muslims, um, or say that they are Muslims, you can no longer treat them as a slave. They cannot be enslaved because the Quran is going to say, hey, that's not cool. So what happens is Arab merchants start to trade non-Muslim people as slaves. And so Africa, if they're not hearing about Islam just yet, what's going to happen is they are being captured in wars, they're being captured in battles, and they're being brought out as slaves because they are not Muslim. Well, you guys, that's going to eventually expand a lot more under the European slave trade. The European slave trade starts with Portugal. Portugal is the first European nation to come down there and sell slaves from Africa. They end up sending their slaves to the Atlantic islands of Madeira, the Azores, and Cape uh, Verde because that is the geographical area where Portugal is actually growing sugarcane on plantations. You guys, sugarcane is where sugar comes from, obviously, um, but it needs really specific geographical climates in order to grow. It needs that hot, moist um, air. It needs um, that uh, heat in order to produce. And so what happens is they're going to develop things called plantations. Plantation is basically an area that is going to be a very, very large farm, but it has a very nice house where the person who owns the house basically owns all the land and controls that growing process. And what happens is sugarcane is not that... Um, fun to harvest. It's very sticky. It's sharp. Um, and so what happens is on those plantations, when they're growing sugarcane, they, first of all, don't want to pay their workers too much because then you lose a lot of money since you have, you know, hundreds of acres growing. And that means hundreds and hundreds of people that you need to pay in order to harvest your crops. But what happens is it's a pain in the rear end to harvest and it's expensive to hire that many people. So what they're going to do is they're going to use slaves, right? You don't have to pay your slaves because you own them and they are slaves. And slaves can't complain when they don't want to actually pick sugarcane because um, people treated their slaves horribly. So basically with this introduction of sugarcane, by 1500, Portugal becomes the world's major supplier of sugar. And this means that they also are relying a lot on slave trade. By the late 1400s, Europeans start arriving in the Americas as well. And um, you guys, North America, South America, we are perfect for growing sugar. We're perfect for growing tobacco, rice, cotton, four major crops that people become addicted to. Um, and so what that means is when Europe comes to the Americas, they see what Portugal's doing. They're like, hey, you're already using slaves for your growing your sugar cane. We're growing sugar too, but now we're going to grow tobacco, rice, and cotton. We're bringing slaves as well. And so Europe actually imports slaves from Africa. They bring them across the Atlantic Ocean in order to grow those um, major crops. So thinking of all of that, I want you to take a moment, answer the essential question in your notes. How did Africa become the focus of world powers during medieval times?